I published uh, Prophetic Imagination in 1978, sort of at the beginning of my uh, scholarly work. And uh, this book, uh, The Practice of uh, Prophetic Imagination, uh, that was published by Fortress last year, uh, is a sort of a sequel after 30 years of uh, thinking about it. Uh, that's not the title that I had proposed, but publishers do that with the books. Uh, I have made a sort of a um, uh, cottage industry out of imagination in uh, Old Testament studies. I understand imagination uh, to be the capacity to host uh, a reality or a world other than the one that is in front of us. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the prophets who lived in uh, the ancient prophets of Israel who lived in a world of, um, of uh, temple theology and dynastic theology and imperial theology uh, were imagining a world uh, different from that. So in this book I have identified the uh, prophetic task as imagining a world as though Yahweh, the God of Israel, were a real agent in the world because the dominant uh, ideologies uh, around us uh, largely exclude God as a serious agent uh, in the world. Uh, I uh, approached this topic uh, because on the one hand I wanted to uh, overcome the conservative idea in the church uh, that prophets are essentially predictors of Jesus. Uh, I don't think that's what they had on their mind. And uh, more uh, closer to home for me, I wanted to combat the liberal idea that uh, prophetic ministry and prophetic preaching really has to do with scolding people about social justice, uh, which is a common assumption in the circles where I move. And I wanted to overcome uh, both of what I think are mistaken ideas, conservative and liberal, uh, by uh, uh, trying to exposit the idea uh, that their work is really the imagining of an alternative world. Uh, it seems to me uh, enormously important that the prophets of Israel, uh, until very late into the Persian period, they're all poets. Uh, and uh, the fact that they speak in a poetic idiom uh, with a rich exploration of, uh, of metaphor and imagery of outrageous kinds, I think means that they were trying to uh, break open the socioeconomic, political, theological assumptions uh, of the world of Jerusalem uh, that they inhabited. Uh, and uh, so by analog, I need to be suggesting that prophetic ministry in our time and place uh, really is an act of imagination uh, that intends to penetrate the dominant ideology of our society that I label uh, as a military consumerism. Uh, so that's kind of how I set it up. I have uh, two uh, preliminary chapters uh, in this book. Uh, one is to say uh, that uh, the prophets assume uh, the narrative of the first five books of the Bible, uh, which is also an act of narrative imagination. Now, if you know anything about critical study in Old Testament, uh, the, the, the key critical assumption uh, for 200 years is that the prophets are antecedent to the Pentateuchal traditions. And obviously the Bible is not set up that way. The Bible is set up so that the narratives of the first books obviously are prior to prophetic poetry. So I've gone uh, sort of that non-critical way of saying that you can't understand the poetry of the prophets if you don't understand the narrative imagination behind it about uh, creation, about Abraham, and about the Exodus, and about Mount Sinai. So. Uh, I see the, this uh, act of poetic imagination of being trying to draw those old narratives uh, into the contemporary uh, life of Israel. Now the two main ideas 
that I have uh, had in this book. As, as you would know, uh, uh, the prophets basically are speakers of judgment and speakers of hope. Uh, so they, up, up until the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, they talk about God's judgment. And after the destruction of Jerusalem, they talk about God's hope. The reason uh, that I took up the first of these topics is that you can hardly talk uh, in the U.S. church about God's judgment. It, it sounds like such a strange, alien, unwelcome idea uh, that I don't know any preacher that wants to do that. Uh, so what I propose in this book is that what the prophets of judgment are really, are really talking about at an emotional level is the reality of social loss. What, what, what they keep saying in Jerusalem is that the way you've got your public life organized means you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose the temple, you're going to lose the monarchy, you're going to lose the city, you're going to lose your political identity, and they did. The, the transposition of judgment into loss uh, seems to me to be worth doing because we now live in the United States. We now live in a society of loss. Uh, almost everybody now knows uh, that our children or grandchildren are not going to have it as good as we have it. So we have lost uh, our capacity to sustain this extravagant standard of living. Uh, the way uh, President Obama mentioned China in the State of the Union message uh, means a common recognition that we have lost our uh, superpower monopoly, particularly in the Pacific. Uh, we have lost much of our moral grounding. We have lost all the things uh, that we used to count on. But we live in a culture of denial. So the guys running for office in Florida are all promising that they're going to restore all of that. And they surely are not. Nobody is going to restore it. So I believe that uh, one task of prophetic imagination in our time and place uh, is to break the ideology of denial and help people face up to and process uh, the profound loss uh, that is all around us now uh, that we keep wishing were not so. That's the first uh, major effort of my book. The second major effort of my book, uh, uh, what, what, what we conventionally talk about prophetic preaching is about the urgency of social justice. But the prophets of the Old Testament, after the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, basically speak, I have a dream speeches about God's capacity for newness that there will be restoration. It will be different from it was. It won't be restoration the way it used to be. But there is a future and there is a hope. So they variously talk about a new Jerusalem, a new Torah, a new temple, a new land, a new king. And I think that in a society of despair, uh, it may be important to say out loud uh, that God is a promise keeper who has promised shalom and that God will bring us toward shalom and that men and women of faith are to live their lives in that hopeful expectation. Uh, and therefore, what I have tried to do is to transpose the prophetic categories of judgment and hope uh, into what I think are uh, contemporary urgencies of uh, loss, uh, 
and openness to God's newness. Now I think there is reason to think that God's newness, God's new public societal newness will take the form uh, that some of us do not welcome. It's going to be a multicultural newness. Uh, it's going to be a newness in which the U.S. exceptionalism uh, is weaker and weaker and uh, cannot be so blatantly proclaimed. Uh, so it's going to be a newness uh, that requires us to uh, come to terms with uh, reality outside of our illusion about uh, preeminence in the world. Uh, and uh, my, my thought about the vocation of prophetic imagination and prophetic preaching is that the dominant ideology of our culture uh, is an incredibly destructive ideology that causes the, the waning of our common humanness. Uh, and I think the uh, disappearance of the middle class and the fact that the rich get richer and the middle class people are dropping into poverty, uh, all of that all of that are signs uh, that this is not a sustainable uh, ideology in the long run. Uh, and therefore, uh, the prophetic task uh, is to invite people to think about and imagine and practice uh, that there really is an alternative way uh, to construe the world outside of the dominant assumptions and the uh, uh, dominant ideology of our culture. Uh, so in that ancient world of Israel, it is uh, not surprising that the prophets were uh, taken to be not credible, so they are variously called uh, crazy people or they are called traitors, uh, all of that kind of thing. And uh, I imagine that uh, in our own time and place that such prophetic imagination is probably unwelcome uh, among those who, uh, who are inured to the dominant ideology. Uh, I think, well first of all I think it has to be done and second I think that increasing numbers of people are beginning to have restless hunches that the dominant ideology of our culture no longer merits our uh, innocent acceptance. Uh, and uh, I think uh, prophetic imagination is never easy, but I suspect there is uh, some opening of space uh, that makes it possible, and uh, uh, that's what my uh, book is aimed at. So uh, that's my uh, big effort. Um, it's an attempt to uh, to uh, make some connections uh, between these ancient texts and the present practice of uh, ministry and faith.